Welcome back, folks, to the WP Tonic Show. This is episode 457. Wow, we really have got a special guest here. I'm a bit of a fanboy myself. We've got Rob Whaling here, um, the joint founder, Drip. Um, he's got a great podcast with his co-host, Startup for the Rest of Us, and he's just got a fantastic history of helping online entrepreneurs rob would you like to quickly introduce yourself to the listeners and viewers yeah hi everybody sorry i'm blocking half my face but i like to use the good microphone so um yeah rob walling i've built some SaaS apps started a conference with a co-founder um startups for the rest of us is the podcast written a couple books just kind of been in this space been in bootstrapping for well, really like 20 years, but that just makes me sound old. And actually had some apps that started getting traction about 15 years ago. So kind of in before it was, it was a thing when there were just a handful of us. And um, I really enjoyed the fact that it's become such a mainstream thing because it was not in 2005. So it's a pleasure it's to be been, on. It's, it's been an amazing ride, really, isn't it? Yeah, it really has. Yeah. Um, and I've got my great co-host, Adrian. Adrian, would you like to introduce yourself to the new listeners and viewers? Hi, everybody. My name is Adrian. I'm the CEO and founder of Groundhog, and we produce and sell marketing automation plugins for businesses that use WordPress. Before we go into this great um, interview with Rob, um, I'd just like to mention uh, our major sponsor, and that is Kinsta Hosting. If you are looking for superior WordPress hosting for yourself or for your clients, I suggest that you go over to Kinsta. They're big enough to have all the t technology, bells and whistles, but still small enough to care. But And they've been hosting the WP Tonic website for about two years now, and they've been a host, um, a sponsor for about two years. And what you get is you get Google Cloud hosting, but you get a superb UX interface and other technologies. Plus, you get some of the best, in my opinion, best support, 24-7 support on the market at the present moment. So if that sounds really interesting, go over to Kinsta, buy one of their plans for yourself or for your clients, and also tell them that you heard about them on the WP Tonic show. So Rob, um, to start off, your, let's start off looking a little bit at your history, because am I correct that your first, going by my memory, your first bootstrap, you bought a company that, was it SEO Longtail was its name? That was, so I had one called Hittail hittail.com. And that was in 2011 that I acquired it. And it was um, really in bad shape at the time. It was a SaaS app that had been built in like 2006 and had been semi-abandoned, but it was still hanging around. The first product, I mean, I launched a bunch of dumb ideas like we all do, especially when, you know, this was before like, oh, you should pick a niche. And I was trying to launch like venture backed ideas, but I was a bootstrapper and I didn't understand that ad models and like trying to get to millions of daily active users doesn't work when you're trying to work, you know, from your, from your basement in essence. So my, the first real success I had was uh, an app called .NET Invoice and that was in 2000. Six oh seven. yeah, that was that, that invoicing when I was yep. mentioning that to Adrian. Yes, and it wasn't even it wasn't SaaS. It was one time downloadable. It was three hundred dollars. You you would download this software and run it on your web server. You know, because this I mean again like SaaS really wasn't we didn't call it that back then. And so um, that was a nice one. It was it was one that taught me that you you know you can make. I said you know first I want to, I want something that can I want to prove this whole concept to myself. Can I be a single founder or a bootstrapper? and just have software that pays the bills. You know, can I have something that pays a car payment or pays a house payment? And that was the one that proved it to me. Okay, for a spin and see how many more of these I need before I can you know, quit the day job in essence. Yeah. Uh oh, I think it broke up on you, yeah. Just a little bit, the power zoom. But it's normally pretty stable. Um, over to Adrian. So you started off with like invoice.net. You said, how many of these did you, uh, did you actually need to start paying off the bills? How many was it? Just out of yeah. So, so .NET invoice wound up doing about 25 grand a year. Um, and I was at the time I was making like 200 grand as a consultant um, in $2,006 or whatever, which was, which was a good life. You know, it was a good life. But I realized that expenses were under a hundred grand. I was the primary breadwinner, but we were living in expensive places like Connecticut, Boston, and, and California. So I needed about four of them is what I thought. But uh, over time, I acquired some that were smaller and some that were bigger, and I built some. And, you know, I, I wound up having this suite of products uh, by 2010. And this was like, I mean, there was that one-time downloadable. There was a wedding 
a website builder, kind of like a really, you know, imagine like Squarespace for wedding websites, but it way, way less powerful, <laughs> you know, and way less expensive and the lifetime value was terrible and, you know, all this stuff. Um, and I had some info products. I had, I mean, like a book on, um, what was it? There was one on like bonsai trees that I acquired from someone. I, cause I had this tool belt of marketing experience that I'd learned. I started learning SEO. I started learning AdWords. I started learning display ads. And I realized that any, it didn't really matter the product as long as I believed in it, you know, I wasn't right. going to buy something that was unethical or something, but as long as it was a good product, hmm. I could just apply the same tool belt to it. So that's, uh, that's what I had. So I wound up having like eight or nine by 2010. And I realized, you know, I think I'm done with this small kind of having a bunch of small things. It was providing full-time income. It was amazing. I was able to quit full-time consulting in 2008 ish. I think it was the end of 2008. And that was life changing for me, right? To not, I didn't have a boss anymore. I just, I literally was living off product income. And I mean, I think that's so many of us, it's like the goal, you know, it's the goal you wanted. So you just, you know, the, the point where you stopped trading time for dollars. Exactly. That was it. Cause I was, a, yeah, I was, I was salaried for a while and then I was consultant, but this, that was the moment in 2008 where I was able to, to do it. And then I, I took time off. I had four hour work week, the whole thing. I mean, I was working 10 hours a week for like a year and, and eventually I got bored with that. And that was when I, you know, uh, per what Jonathan asked about earlier, I, I acquired a uh, hittail.com, which was a SaaS app in 2011. And that was kind of my next challenge. I did it very intentionally. It was like, I want to level up my skills. I want to learn new things. I want to do something really hard, which is, you know, breathe life back into a failing app. In essence, it's like literally going down. Servers are going down for three days at a time. Like, um, that was my next challenge. It's still going, is it? Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. I sold it. So I, I built it up. Um, it was doing about a th somewhere around 1500 a month when I bought it and I built it up to the, at its peak, it was 30,000 a month. But, um, most months, I mean, it was solidly in the twenties for a long time. And, and while it was in the twenties, I realized, boy, this is not a, I, I'm concerned this, that Google may kill this app. You know, it was precarious. It was in, in the SEO space and I was just becoming nervous about, I had sold off all my other apps to focus on it. And so I started thinking, what's the next thing I could do? And that's where Drip came about was like, I want to be ambitious and I don't want to be under the thumb of, I don't want to have the platform risk that you have when you build on so, Google. And so I, I apologize before I say this, my English humor really, Rob, hopefully you're going to laugh at it. So you, you mentioned Drip, this is where the nightmare began, wasn't it? Rob. Well, it's uh, <laughs> it's one of those. I remember, that, yeah, I remember some of your podcasts where, with your co-founder, um, where you, I, I got the sense that you literally wanted to cry in your coffee. You know. Yeah, we did often, actually. Um, yeah, there's there. If you go to startupstoriespodcast.com, or I think you can just search for launch an audio documentary um, in like iTunes and such. We recorded. I think what you're referring to is we recorded <laughs> for about 15 to 30 minutes a week for almost a year. So we had this nine or 10 hours of audio and we didn't release any of it until like a year later. And I edited that down to like 90 minutes. So it's just the best bits. There's a little bit of music in it, but it is agonizing. Like I still, I'm like traumatized when I listen back because it, because it's the early days and it ever, as we all know, it's so hard. Like the hardest part is these early days when you don't know what you're building and for whom. And that was basically how I spent 2013 with Derek, uh, my co-founder trying to suss out, is this going to fail? Like I, I thought I was pretty good at it by that time. And yet you can hear the doubt, you know, in my voice during that time. We just seem problem after problem after problem. Yep. Yep. Oh, customers don't like it. The churn's too high. The, especially in the early days, that all went away when we really, really lost. Uh, and there were technical issues. And then it's like, well, we can't scale. And then, you know, the database is failing. And, the, you know, yes, that's what it is, though. That's, I mean, to me, having a high growth startup is, is absolutely a blessing and a curse. You know, there are no there are no Cinderella stories is something to say often. And what I mean by that is you can have a, an app that grows really well and that's a Cinderella story, but under the covers, it is always a shit show. Always. I've never talked to a founder who has not said, Oh my gosh, this was so painful. Even whether they're talking about it publicly or not, it's, um, it's hard, but then it, but it's, it's worth it. It's what we, it's who we, it's who we are. Right. And it's worth it for the outcome. I mean, you know, we, we, we sold it and I, had the freedom to ride off into the sunset if I wanted to. And that's, it was totally worth the, the, I'll say a few years of struggle, you know, to, to do that, to wind up having that, that end result. Over to you, Adrian. So, uh, I mean, I, I feel you. <laughs> um, what, 
you know, you, what you went through that, like those three years of struggle and, and trying to figure out and answer all of these questions, like, is it going to work? Why isn't this working? Why is there high churn? What are, what are the, some of the things that you did? Because, you know, this for, it's not just for SaaS business. It's really, that's a, that same struggle is applicable for every business under the sun because everybody more or less goes through that same thing, especially as like a solo founder or solo operator. What are, what are the, some of the things that, that you did in order to kind of like, you know, help yourself see the light at the end of the tunnel, so to say? Yeah, no, you're absolutely right. Anytime you're building something new, that's, that's there because you just don't know, does anyone care? Is anyone going to use it? So I think the, the big thing that I was doing, one, I, I didn't handle it as well as I should have. I was stressed a lot and I wished this time around. So now I'm doing Tiny Seed, which is a startup accelerator uh, for bootstrappers. I am much more calm this time. And a lot of it is from the lessons that I learned building Drip and how stressful that was. And I, I, when, I, when we started Tiny Seed, I said, I'm, I'm not going to live like that again. You know, so that was one thing was like, be less stressed because I was worried about things and being worried and thinking about them is fine, but ruminating on the same stuff when you can't do anything about it and there's no new information is not helpful, right? It's a, it's a negative mm-hmm. pattern. So that was one thing um, that I learned from it. The other thing was we, what was, we iterated pretty quickly. So Derek Reimer was my co or yeah, was my co-founder with Drip. And we had the luxury of, I was basically just talking to customers and doing support and onboarding and success and all that just nonstop. So I was very close to the customers and Derek was just cranking on code. So we moved really quickly. And that I had the luxury of like, if I was doing both, it would have been exponentially harder. And I had done both in the past, but with this one, I was like, I think this one's big enough that <laughs> I need, I need someone in my corner as well. Um, so having a, if you don't have a co-founder, having a mastermind group, you know, that you meet with uh, once a week, once a month, whatever it is, someone that knows your story and can follow it, that's not your spouse or significant other is really helpful because then you can, you can cry in, in, in your beer together. Um, and another thing was we, w- since we were able to ship stuff relatively quickly, we did see what was working and what was not. And we were able to iterate instead of it taking two years, maybe it took six or eight months because we just kept shipping and kept asking and kept, we iterated quick enough. Does that make sense? So there was, it wasn't like, oh my gosh, it's two years of grind with no progress. It was two years of grind or three years, but we had a lot of progress along the way and we had a lot of validation and, you know, we would launch something and it wouldn't work, but we would hear, well, if you did this, you know, it would. And so um, there were, there were some dark times, but they weren't, it wasn't years of dark times. It was months of dark times. And I think that we all have to be able to put up with that because entrepreneurship is hard. Wow, succinct. <laughs> Jonathan? I think, um, I don't know, I've got time for another one. Let's go for a break, actually, folks. We're going for a break. Can we continue this fascinating conversation with one of my online heroes, Rob um, from Drip? Uh, um, you're, you're always going to be known for Drip, really, aren't you? A little bit, aren't you? Oh, I'm uh, sure. And that's yeah, fine. And yeah. microconf, you know, people and the podcast. Yeah. I mean, there's, there's things. But yeah, no, I... Uh, I'm proud of Drip. Proud of what yeah, we built there. Should be. We'll be back in a few moments, folks. We're coming back. We've had a, a fascinating first half, the history of Rob Riley. And um, before we go into uh, the second part of the show, I want to mention one of our other great sponsors, and that's Lifter NMS. So if you're building um, for a client or you're looking for yourself, to build an online course on WordPress, which I think is an excellent idea, you need a great platform tool, and that's what Lifter NMS provides. It's built by two friends of mine, um, Chris and Tom, and they've built a fantastic learning management platform. So um, it's fully featured. They offer fantastic value in the free product, and they offer even better value on their premier solutions. So if that's of interest for yourself or your clients, go over to lifterlms.com and also tell them that you heard about them on the WP Tonic show. So, Rob... um, I think uh, quite a while ago, it could be almost on your podcast, um, you passed some remarks that you weren't totally interested in the WordPress space. And because it was open, I think some of your arguments, because you had concerns because it was open source and that. Um, Through Tiny Seed, I noticed that you have actively invested 
in, in um, startups that are in the WordPress um, sector. So uh, I presume you're, I'm interested in this, I presume that you've changed your attitude to some degree and also I'm interested in why your attitudes have changed around the WordPress ecosystem. I don't recall ever saying that. I, I think that, yeah, no, I've never been. I'll put uh, words in your mouth. I'll put yeah, it to I, I don't remember. I, um, I don't think I would have said that. I've never felt that way because it's open source. The only thing that, the thing I love about WordPress is the, is the ecosystem there. I, I, I wouldn't do it if I wanted to personally build a seven figure or more software company, I wouldn't do WordPress because the, trying to get the subscriptions is still a challenge. It's a lot of one-time sales, things plateau. You see that the way folks get bigger, I mean, there's only a handful that I know of, of seven figure product, seven or eight figure product businesses compared to the thousands of large SaaS apps. Um, it, it, in, in WordPress, that was a weird sentence, sorry, but there, there, it, it's a lot harder to get seven or eight figures in WordPress because it's not recurring. So that would, it would have been an issue um, or a concern that I would raise, but I would never say not to do it. And it wouldn't, it wouldn't have anything to do with the open source piece of it. Um, I think that what I like about WordPress is it's gr really great for, especially if you really just want that first, that kind of first win. So I have this thing called the stair step approach where I say, Hey, step one is to get a one-time sale, get something up to a couple thousand bucks. You learn so much doing that and going from zero to a thousand or 2000. Typically that step one app is, like I said, it's a one-time sale. It has a single traffic channel. It's really hard to grow past that one or $2,000 mark. Um, and WordPress plugins fit really well in that. And you have built-in distribution if you can figure out how to rank in the WordPress repository. Um, and that, that's the good news. Now, could I take a plugin and make it a seven-figure business? I mean, it's possible. It's really hard. You know, we've seen a few folks do it, but they tend to just pivot into SaaS. Um, so I like it for the early stage stuff. And if WordPress is your thing and you want to, be, um, you know, I think of, I'm trying to think like Pippin, Pippin's company and Brad Tenard's yeah, company, yeah. you know, they, they basically just, you just keep building more and more plugins and that's cool too. It's not something that I personally would want to do. And, and we only have a couple models, a couple examples of it. Whereas I can point again to hundreds of, of small SaaS apps that do six and seven figures. So that, that's the trade-off. I think it's way easier to get a WordPress app or I'm sorry, WordPress plugin to two grand a month than it is to get a SaaS app to two grand a month. I think there's less code. I think there's less um, there's just a lot less complication and the amount you learn from that, you can then parlay, you know, if you got one or two WordPress plugins doing five grand, 10 grand a month, even two to four grand a month, you Use learn that to so fund the SaaS much. app. <laughs> Absolutely. That's the stair step. Yep. The second yeah. step is getting enough that you buy your time out. Third step is if you want to get into SaaS, which I'm not saying, saying you have to, but recurring revenue is really nice. Then you use that to fund your, your time. Much like I pulled from all of my little products to buy to buy Hittail, right? And I didn't have the 30 grand to buy that. I pulled them out of some businesses that I'd acquired and built. Mm -hmm. And then I used Hittail, grew that up to 2025. I, we couldn't have built Drip. I mean, I was, I was, I self-funded Drip. It was um, t almost 200 grand in the hole in essence, yeah. right? Before, and I couldn't have done that out of, I mean, I, I made $6 an hour in my first job. Like I didn't have the money to do that, but it, it's a stair step, right? And that's, that's how I think about it. That's great. Over to you, Adrian. So we, you talk, we talked a little bit about Tiny Seed. Now, would you mind just explaining what Tiny Seed is for anybody who's not familiar? Because we, it, we've just been dropping the name a little bit, but not sure. everybody might be familiar with that. Yeah, yeah. So it's, it's my next act after Drip. Um, Tiny Seed, it's the first startup accelerator that's designed for people who would traditionally bootstrap, right? So we looked around and I said, for years I've been saying, why isn't there a y, kind of a Y Combinator thing that provides support, a little bit of money um, and, and mentorship and a network? But for folks like us, right, who want to build let's say a million dollar ARR, $5 million, $10 million ARR. Facebook, Google, Uber, LinkedIn, you know, don't want to build these, these unicorns. And there really is not much funding for, for not really any funding aside from AD.VC um, and there are no accelerators. And so that's, that's what we did. We raised, I've never raised money before and we raised a four and a half million dollar fund and we did our first batch of um, essentially, you know, we funded them. They're, they were bootstrapping and we funded them. They're no longer bootstrappers, but they're, they're not also not venture funded either, right? It's yeah. now, an, there's an in-between and our terms are very founder friendly. If they want to run the company and take dividends out, that works for us. They don't need the big exit. Um, it's remote and it's a year long. So we have two folks in Europe, one uh, company in, in Mexico, and then everybody else is, is in the States. And so we try to be more close to the startups or the rest of us ethos, you know, microconf just of like, Hey, grow as fast as you can, but like, don't kill yourself. Like 
take, take time. We all have families. Don't work 70 hour weeks and um, let's be Profit ambitious. First. <laughs> yeah, yeah, in essence, right? Build, let's build really profitable startups. We're going to charge real money to real customers um, and, and build you know, a real product that does that rather than do this whole ad, ad revenue model that's just, uh, you know, and it's not, it's not go big or go home, right? It's not bet everything, crash the company. It's like, let's, let's, let's change your life and, you know, with, with a real good win. Um, you know, like a, a small, a small profitable SaaS is still making more money, money than Uber. <laughs> that's right. <laughs> At the yeah, end no, the day, really, you're exactly it? right. Right. And that's, and, and a, and a small profitable SaaS. I mean, let's say you built a SaaS app to 3 million bucks. Net margins on SaaS can be as high, you know, can be 30 to 50%. So you build something to 3 million bucks. If it throws off a million and a half or even a million dollars a year in free cash flow, like that is life-changing for any of us. So why should that be a, that's an abject failure to a venture capitalist. And for us, that's a really nice base hit. And we want to help more people get there because it's really hard, right? I mean, as you've heard me say, like it was hard for me and I had all this, uh, I had an audience and I had all this stuff and I want more people to get there, right? And that's in line with kind of everything I've been doing for, talking about and doing for 10, 15 years. What kind of, what kind of companies like really like fit really nicely into, into your portfolio there? Yeah, you know, as Jonathan mentioned, um, I, I was trying to rack my brain. I think it's two of the first 10. So we ran our first batch. Uh, we're about seven months into it. Um, so we had 10 companies. We have 10 companies. And then we're interviewing now for a second batch, which I think will be a little bit bigger. Um, the first batch of 10, there were two that had WordPress plugins. Yeah, one of them is he's coming. I've, I forgot the gentleman's name. I apologize, but he's coming on the show. It's the, um, it I think Peter? one of them's a podcast. That's platform. Craig. Yep. It's yep. Craig, Craig Hewitt. Ca- yep. Company's Castos. Yep. Yeah. He's and coming he's, on the show, Rob. He started with a WordPress plugin uh, that I believe he acquired, and it is was podcast hosting. And seriously, simple podcasting is what it's called. And then he built the SaaS on top of it. And that's a great model, you know? You get the you get the lead gen and then you can get the recurring revenue. So, um, but generally we focus on subscription software. I mean, that's really our bottom line. So you could say it's SaaS is really it, but we also have some marketplaces that are kind of, that, that charge a subscription. Um, we don't, so far we haven't done any hardware just because we, you know, we fund $120,000 for the first founder and 60 for each additional founder. Yeah. It's not enough money to like do a lot of hardware, right? You know, um, and writing code is, is pretty free, right? <laughs> that's the thing, right? Yeah, we tend to really like to, a team of, you know, either one where the person is technical or two where one is technical and one is either a sales or, a, you know, perhaps a subject matter expert. And um, yeah, you can look. I mean, if you go to tinyc.com slash latest, you'll see we list out all the companies and it's, it's subscription software across all the, I mean, the gamut. There's some tight verticals, you know, where it's like we only serve schools, after school programs, or there's a horizontal, you know, of like this is candidate reimbursement software for, and we're going after the Fortune 5000, you know, so it's really runs the gamut. We just look at the business metrics and talk to the founders and try to help them. Help them I'm, I'm curious about the, cause so you're doing your second batch. So you're, you said you're seven months into the first one already though, right? Yeah. Yeah. I, I'd love to hear if there are like any like super awesome, amazing results that you've experienced so far. I mean, yeah, I can't, like, I can't share revenue numbers publicly yeah. or anything, but yeah, of course. Um, and I almost, I see, I don't want to single out put folks yeah. and say like, oh, these two companies are really successful because it implies the others aren't. But the answer mm-hmm. is yes, it's, it's gone very well. It has gone, um, I'd say be, uh, it's gone at or above my expectations of what I thought we could do for the companies. I think a big surprise has been, you know, the money originally we thought, well, there's a bunch of people working part-time on these SaaS apps. And if we give them 120K, they can live for a year and focus on it. And really only two, maybe three of the companies we funded needed that money to quit the job. Everyone else oh, were already working full-time. And some of them because they were making enough money from it and others because like the folks who moved to Mexico, they used to live in Seattle. And they moved to Mexico because their app was, they're just capital efficient people, right? So um, that was a surprise. And that's something we, you know, that, that people use the money now for hiring more developers or hiring a marketer or just investing in growth. Um, and that's, that's been good. And the other thing is like the batch, the community aspect of it. We're in Slack group, do weekly calls. That has been hugely, hugely valuable for people along with the mentorship. So that's, that's been good to see that it's three legs of a stool, not just, you're giving people money because that doesn't sound fun to me, right? It's the right. other stuff that the interaction that, that is important. Yeah, I think it's an exciting model. I, I actually think it's a model that a lot of states, um, um, economic authority, economic growth authorities, it's a model that a lot of people should really look at, isn't it, Rob? Yeah. 
I, I think it's, if you look at the number of businesses that are venture fundable, it's whatever it is, less than 1% of all, you know, companies started or something. The model that we're using, I think it could fund the other 90%, you know, or the other 95%. Um, I mean, we wouldn't, we wouldn't do it with dry cleaners and, you know, bricks and mortars and such, but te- technology companies, I mean, if I had the, if I could raise a fund today and I could fund, we get people applying with hardware startups, not solely hardware, but it's like software added, value added hardware. We had some people with kind of biotech-ish type stuff. Like uh, I would, I would love to do a lot of this. I think it could, it could work for many, many, many businesses. And that's really the goal, right? Is to rise, rise the, raise the tide so that all the boats can go up and not just go after that 1%. Now, have you got any, you know, this is going to be, I'm notorious for my broad questions, so I apologize. Um, Adrian's much more Pacific than me. Uh, Rob, but have you got any kind of insights to what founders, apart, because I've started my own company, um, a SaaS company, and I'm not a developer, so I'm I'm totally bonkers, aren't yeah, I, Rob? Yeah, it's tough. I'm, yeah. I'm bloody mad as they come. So, uh, um, so uh, there we go. Uh, um, but, if somebody's a coder and they're looking to go down this road, have you got insights about some other skills that they've really got to have in their quiver if this is going to, if they're going to get a success, Rob? Yeah, absolutely. And I would say, I mean, I know a lot of non-developer founders who like Craig from Castos, who you're going to have on the show. He's not a developer and he built Castos to it's a very successful SaaS app. So it's I've totally got, doable. I've, it's just I've hard. I've ended up you know? dyeing my hair now, though, Rob. Yeah, my, no. hair, <laughs> of this, my hair's gone all actually white. Actually, uh, white. When know. I started, I, you had hair like mine. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. I've lost my hair and I'm dying it now. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I really think of it as, um, I mean, there's three, there's kind of the trifecta of skills, right? It's, um, it's development to build the product. And that I include in that product knowledge, which is not always the same as being a developer. Being able to write code doesn't mean you can build a great product, right? Um, and the second one is marketing and the third one is sales. And you got to figure out, are you going to be one, two, or all three? And which, you know, does your market need all three? Um, typically, if you're going to build SaaS, you need that developer slash product role. If you're going to build a SaaS, let's, you know... Um, I'm trying to, well, cast, I keep bringing up Castos, but they're an example here. Like they don't need to do sales because their price points are low, right? They're like 19, 39, 40. You know, it's mostly self-service. Hittail was like that when I had it. We didn't do any sales. So I didn't need that skill. But you, then you need a wide funnel, right? So you need to learn how to market. You need to learn how to drive traffic. And whether that's with content, paid acquisition, you know, there's, there's a bazillion, so, you know, social media. I mean, on and on and on. There are ways to do that, building an audience. Um, that... Those are the those are the three skills, and you have to look at your market. You know, a, a different example is RMB, which is also in the, in Tiny Seed, and he's going after the Fortune 5000. It's reimbursement software for for candidates that they fly in. Well, it's for him. It's all about sales. Like they they don't get that many leads, but the leads they get, they close a lot, and you know the price points are. 500 a month and up, right? You don't, you only need two, three, four of those a month to like actually grow a business. So either be, either get good at sales or get good at, at marketing if you're a developer. All right. Um, we're we're going to end the podcast part of the show. Ho- hopefully Rob will agree to stay on for another 10, 15 minutes for what we call bonus content, Rob. Uh, um, but we like to keep the podcast around 30 minutes. Um, so Rob, um, what's the best way people can find out about what you're up to and your thoughts. Yeah, sure. Well, if folks are listening to podcasts anyways, search for startups for the rest of us. Um, we've been doing yeah. it 474 episodes over oh. more than uh, 10 years ish. So it's, we ship every week, you know, every Tuesday morning. Um, that's the best way. And then I'm on Twitter at Rob Walling. And Rob is notoriously, he's a very busy man, but he's very approachable. He tries to be, I'm very impressed by how you treat people in general, Rob. It's fantastic. Adrian, how can people find out more about you and what you're up to? So if you're in need of marketing automation uh, and you run a WordPress business, then you can head over to groundhog.io. We've been service. We are serving businesses that use WordPress and helping them communicate with their list better. 
And um, if you want to hear more WP Tonic, why don't you join us for our round table show on Fridays? Yes, I do two podcasts plus a week. I am totally bonkers. But it's a really raucous, interesting discussion with um, some WordPress junkies. And we also discuss other stuff. Another thing, if you really want to support the show, is give us a review on iTunes. Yes, folks, I know it's a pain. But if you go there and give us a review and it's funny, I will read it out. Uh, um, that's great, isn't it? We'll be back next week with another fantastic guest like Rob. We'll be back soon, folks. Bye. Bonus content. Over to you, Adrian. Um, is there is there anything that you wanted to share, Rob? Any any cool things that you've experienced? Any any little tiny tidbits of knowledge that you've come across recently that you just find extremely interesting and fascinating? You know, you know, I always find it. Uh, I I I have traditionally not loved Twitter. I don't love the format. It's short form. I feel like it's ephemeral, right? So I haven't been on Twitter a lot, but over the past few months, I have been, and I've been posting a lot of thoughts there. Um, about kind of how I think about entrepreneurship and things that I'm running into with, with you know, the founders uh, in the batch. But what's funny is all the stuff I've done, like the podcast and the, I used to blog and I've written three books. And, and I, I did this one tweet that I think is like one of the most, it has like 141 retweets. Like it's one of the most popular tweets I've ever done. And all it was, was it said, if I were starting a company today, I would use, and then I have a bulleted list, a G Suite for, G, for calendar, email, and temporary docs, Notion for permanent docs, Zoom, Calendly. You know, it's like 10 tools. And that got so many like people interested about it that I feel like it's, I have mixed emotions about it. You know, it's always the ones, whereas I, I had uh, some like what I consider like pretty deep thinking tweets where I'm like analyzing things, you know, um, I don't know, when Zen founder, like when my wife was in, this is a couple of tweets, when, when my wife was in grad school, they had a running joke in research lab about how your N of one doesn't prove anything, right? The plural of anecdote is not data. Be very careful about drawing general conclusions for narrow experience. And then I go on. So I can, and that got like six retweets, you know, 50 likes, but it's like the tools one is the one that goes off the hook. So um, it's I always the that, listicles, right? People just really love is. lists. It's funny. So I think that's a, that's a tidbit to take away, you know. Twitter traction equals lists or lists equals Twitter traction. There you go. You heard yeah. it here first. <laughs> yes, now, indeed. Um, I've got kind of a little big question. If you don't want to go down this road, Rob, I understand. But I thought, you know, I admire your intellect. So I thought I'd give you this, this one. Um, tech for a number of years was seen as the kind of strappy um, kid taking on the world champion um over the past couple of years how tech is seen and especially online SaaS startups the mood's darkened quite a bit isn't it you know um there's like google we facebook um uber it, uber yeah <laughs> the, i call them the cockroaches <laughs> the internet. Oh, yeah, sorry uh um it's really darkened, and then you got the political situation, which I, I imagine you will not want to go down. But it's all kind of combined into. Um, do you think this was automatically going to happen, or do you think there's specific forces that could be reversed? Because can what the present situation, capitalism, you know, starting your own little business and trying to improve your lot, it seems to be being made unpopular doesn't it i i wouldn't agree with that i think that it's the monopoly it's the big ones like i don't think there's pushback about drip or you know no. from the world you know about drip or hit tail or or anything that we're working on it our customers like it or they don't but we're not we don't have the power that facebook and lyft and google and uber and you know all these big companies and they are, have become monopolies and that is where society starts to not love it right and there's all the there's privacy and there's being able to if you can manipulate an election i mean that's crazy i think personally i think it was kind of an inevitability that you know the oil trust in the u.s in the 1800s and early 1900s they had to do the sherman antitrust act to break them up and then they would just reform eventually they would just acquire 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 and it would rehappen. consolidation is kind of an inevitability and these are winner take all markets right or winner take most i mean we have uber and lyft and but who else is there you know and we have google 
and Bing and DuckDuckGo, you know, I mean, Google is like 90 something percent. So, I, but I don't think that has reflected that poorly on us aside. I guess GDPR has brought down headaches for us, but I don't get the feeling that like if I, when I, if I were to go to a cocktail party with normal people that are not like the three of us and not like your listeners, you know, and say, hey, I run a software company and we provide services, marketing automation services or SEO. I don't think they're like, oh, wow. Well, you're like one of those evil tech companies. I don't yeah. get that. You know what I mean? I don't get that yeah. impression. But I don't, I don't disagree with you that a lot of people think that Facebook and Google and those are not, you know, are evil, maybe a strong word, but are doing negative, you know, having negative repercussions. Well, how can the situation be reversed? You got any insights? Oh, boy. Um, you know, I, what they've done in the past is they, they break them up, right? Yeah. And I don't... I, but I struggle with that. I, I don't see, I don't feel like I'm educated enough on, I mean, I have ideas, but it's like, I'm not an economist and I hate speaking when I'm not an, exp I hate mm. having opinions on things that I don't actually feel I'm not. Well, it never stopped me, Rob. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. See, that's because if I were to say, well, they've broken them up in the past. It's like, should they break Facebook and Google up? How does that even work? You know, yeah. I, I, I don't know. I wish I had a better, better thought. Oh, I would have know. to read up on it to answer it well, I think. Yeah, over to you, Adrian. I mean, I guess I'd guess for whatever, whatever new company, this, I, can you just like stop them from buying other companies at this point? Just stop the consolidation? I don't know. I mean, they do, right? They have to approve. There's regulatory approval. Like when, isn't it like called the SEC Horizon or something? And Yahoo. Yeah. yeah. SEC, is that who approves them? Yeah. I think you're right. Yeah. Remember? Cause like T-Mobile was going to sell and it got approved or didn't. I mean, there's a whole, there's a six month process for that. So yes, they could do that. They could start saying, Hopefully they don't say it for any tech company. Hopefully they just say it for the big ones, right? Because you don't want it to get in our hair. But um, that would be one thing. Yeah. I don't know if that reverses it though. Yeah, let's, let's finish off a uh, last question, Rob, because I know you, you've got to be off. Uh, um, and we really appreciate your time, Rob. Sure. Um, let's finish off with a, a, a more nicer ending than talking about these horrible monopolies. Um, do you think it, it's still bright? There's a, you know, things have got a bit more complicated more competitive um in the sector that we've been talking about but do you still feel there's still great opportunities for people starting their bootstrap companies absolutely i see it every day you know i mean i host a conference called microconf and when i go there i see people starting brand new businesses that get traction and i think a big thing to think about is there's only you can grind it out and it'll take years and years and that's that's cool it's not necessarily fun um or you can try to build an unfair advantage for yourself, an unfair competitive advantage. And really the, the four that I know of, I think they're the only four, is um, either to be early to a space. And that's where you're just, you know, Woo themes, when 80 built it, was that like the first 80 PNR, it was like the first premium WordPress themes that I had ever heard of. And he was super early. Bear Metrics, if you've heard of them, they're a SaaS subscription. Josh was the first one to have one click Stripe you know, uh, uh, analytics and he grew very quickly. So they were just early and you could say it's luck or you could say they're, they're smart enough to be early. I'm not, I'm not good at being early. It's just not my personality, but that's one way. And the other way is to build an audience and it's tough to build a SaaS app on an audience alone, but the audience tends to get you a good network and get your respect. And then it allows you to build partnerships from there. I, it doesn't necessarily bring a bunch of customers, but it will bring, uh, it can bring, the network to then reach other people's audiences. So building an audience, um, having a great network is the third one. Some people I know don't have an audience. Um, I'll give like Ruben Gomez. He's the founder of BidSketch. You may have never heard of him. He knows so many people. And when that guy starts a new thing, he just starts ringing them up. Hey, what do you think about it? You know what I mean? So um, audience, network, being early. And the fourth one is getting really good, like world-class at, at marketing. You know, and growth hacking, some people call it. But the people who are really good at growth, like Noah Kagan, Sean Ellis, um, uh, Heat and Shaw, like they are at the, they're in the next level. It's like being a professional ball player and we're all in high school, you know, they are next level. And those are really the four things that I've seen if you want to try to grow fast. Um, and I'm not saying you have to do that, but th those are the things I'd be working on if, if I were starting today. Oh, thank you so much, Rob. And hopefully you will agree at some stage, like at the end of next year to come back on the show. It's been a, sure. a real pleasure having you on the show. It was great. Thank you. And I'm sure you enjoyed Adrian's questions. I'm not, I'm not sure about why, but there we go. Uh, um, we'll be back. <laughs> <Enjoyed all the laughs> <questions>. <laughs> we, we, we'll be back next week with another fantastic guest like Robert. We'll see you soon, folks. Bye.